Okay, so um, this is not actually, this is more conceptual versus actually going through examples because I have a video going through examples of solving problems with hyperbolas. What I wanted to do here is kind of show you, or kind of talk about how the conic sections are connected, where a hyperbola comes from, so you can kind of understand the bigger picture when it comes to these. So if we go back to conic sections, those were originally studied by the Greeks, and they didn't study them based off of the form that we are using in this course. So they had it all multiplied out. So they were looking at equations of the form ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared plus dx plus ey plus f. So um, lots of <laughs> lots of things going on. Basically, they multiplied everything out and they set it equal to zero. So when you have that form of an equation with two variables, x and y, circles specifically have a equal to c and parabolas have a times c equals zero. Ellipse, the ellipses, those are a, c are greater than zero and the hyperbola that's AC is less than zero. So what I want you to focus on here is the similarities between the ellipse and the hyperbola because they are very, very similar. One has these values A times C, which is greater than zero. The other one has it less than zero. And this um, oppositeness shows up a lot when you're comparing ellipses to hyperbolas and and a hyperbola is basically like taking an ellipse and kind of converting it, taking it up like inside out, so to speak. So um, our forms of these equations that we use are sort of all kind of similar to the form of a circle here. So a circle is you've got this double cone that's kind of in one inverted and you're just taking a cross section horizontally. The ellipse, you're taking a cross section slanted through one of them. And then the hyperbola, your cross section is vertical through both of them. And that's where you get these three different shapes. The equations are very similar when you go back to the fact that when you look at them in terms of circles. So the equation of a circle is x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared and r is that radius. If you divide both sides by r squared, that gives you a form that's very similar to the ellipse, where now you've got these squared portions over something squared and then it's equal to one. So if you compare this to the equation of an ellipse, the only difference between a circle and an ellipse is that the ellipse, what you're dividing by, don't have to be the same number. If they're equal to the same number, then it's a circle. Otherwise, you've got a squared and b squared. And then you compare this to the hyperbola, which is basically the same equation as an ellipse. It's just now it's a minus in between there instead of a plus. So I mentioned that the ellipse and the hyperbola, are they're kind of like opposites. We've got on this previous screen, the ellipse is a times c greater than zero, the hyperbola is less than zero. And you can see that with this equation where the ellipse is a plus, the hyperbola is a minus. So these are all, when, these are why these are grouped together because they are all basically you're taking minor changes to the equation and you get a completely different shape. So we're gonna be focusing on comparing the ellipse to the hyperbola so you can see the difference here and you can really see how they're related. So let's look at the actual definitions of the shapes. So the, an ellipse, the definition is that the sum of the differences between your foci or your foci and some point that's on it is constant. 
So I said the ellipse and the hyperbola are basically like opposites. So instead of the sum being constant for the hyperbola, you're looking at the difference being constant. And then we actually take the absolute value of the difference because um, we're always going to, we just want to have like the positive value here. And so depending on the order of the subtraction, you could get a negative. So you just take the absolute value of it. But so the ellipse is the sum of the distances. And then the hyperbola is the difference of the distances. But you still have two foci, and then you have this distance between them on a point. Just one is the sum and one is the difference. That's the a very minor change here, but it makes a big difference in the actual shapes. So let's look at the equations here. So I have in blue the things that are different. So you can see how little is changed between these two things. So for the ellipse, it's a plus in between your two fractions. For the hyperbola, it's a minus. They both have a center of h comma k. They both have vertices that are located at h plus or minus some value a. They both have foci at h plus or minus some value, which is c. They both have a value of b squared. Now this is where it's different. For the ellipse, it's a squared minus c squared. And then for the hyperbola, it's c squared minus a squared. It's like you're doing the opposite thing here. For the ellipse, we call it the major axis, which is 2a. For the hyperbola, it's still 2a, but now it's called the transverse axis. So we've got these slight differences, but they're nearly identical in the equations. They both have a center, the vertices, the foci, those are all the same. So Let's look at the shapes here again and kind of look at these values and look at the comparisons. So this image of the ellipse, this comes from the textbook. We've got this square root of b squared uh, plus c squared. It's just showing how you get that equation for b squared. It's from the Pythagorean theorem from these triangles. Now, it doesn't quite work the same when you have hyperbola because you don't really have a um, I mean, you can make a triangle. It's just going to be slightly different because it's not always going to be a right triangle, which is what's used for the ellipse. So your, your values are slightly different. Now, notice that on the ellipse, this vertical is B that they've got labeled. And we don't have a point B labeled on the hyperbola because that doesn't, there is no kind of straight vertical point on a hyperbola. But they both have the value A and the value C. And so the value C is always the difference between the center and the foci. Now what's sort of different here is that a foci in the ellipse is inside the ellipse and the foci for the hyperbola is kind of outside. So you, I, I consider it outside because it's on the outer parts of these, these dots versus inside. Like I feel like the inside would be closer to the center between your two shapes. So there's a slight difference there where your foci for the ellipse are inside, but they're kind of outside for the hyperbola. But the distance between them, the center and those points is still C. And then we've got these vertices. So on the hyperbola, the vertices are these values that I'm highlighting in green and the distance between the center and that is A. Generally, your vertices can be these points that I'm circling on the ellipse. That distance is A, but now they're kind of outside. So notice that your foci and your vertices are sort of reversed they're flip-flopped on where they're located and which one is closer to the center. 
And that's really a key difference between the ellipse and the hyperbola is that your vertices and your foci, they're kind of flip-flopped here. And so that's why I think of the hyperbola as sort of inverting the ellipse. So the ellipse, you know, we normally have this going on, but when I think of inverting it, it'd be like, you're just kind of taking the mirror image and that's where you get your, your hyperbola shapes because you're kind of taking that mirror image and then they're not connecting anymore because you're kind of splitting it apart. And that's where you get your shape of the hyperbola is that it's like you're, you're cutting off whatever you've got here and you're taking a mirror image, which makes then your foci, when you take that ear, mirror image, they're now on the outer part instead of the inner part. So it's, you can think of the hyperbola as like if you cut an ellipse in two and then flipped each half outwards. And that's where you get the hyperbola. So that's, that's how these things are related. They're very, the hyperbola and the ellipse are crazy related. <laughs> I mean, they're near identical and it's just this, these minor changes that get this total different shape. So let's talk about eccentricity because this is a, a property of ellipses or ellipses, but it's also a property of hyperbola. So the equation is the same. It's C over A. Now for the ellipse, your value is always between zero and one. For a hyperbola, it's now greater than one. So if it's closer to zero, for an ellipse, you're getting a, um, you get a circle when you're eccentric, an eccentricity of close to zero is a circle shape. And if it's close to one, it's like you're squishing this vertical distance here. It's getting squished down. So it kind of gets more um, narrow vertically when your eccentricity is close to one. The picture here doesn't make it look very narrow, but it's like you're getting more narrow. For a hyperbola, when your, um, your eccentricity has to be greater than one. And the larger it is, the, the vertical distance. And when I say vertical distance, it's like we've got these shapes. These things kind of get higher up. So this would be what I'm drawing here would be a large eccentricity. It's like the gap here gets bigger. But when it's close to one, it gets very narrow, much like the ellipse here. So when you've got this eccentricity close to one, you've got these very narrow pieces. When it goes to zero on the ellipse, it's a circle. So perfect circle. And when it gets really large on the hyperbola, it gets kind of wider. Your, your branches have a larger distance between the top and the bottom of that. So I wanted to kind of make the connection here, the eccentricity, what that means in terms of your ellipse and your hyperbola and, and your different shapes here. So hyperbolas are used a lot in radar, sound detection, um, anything where you're bouncing something off like sound waves, light, you're bouncing something off of something else. So ground penetrating radar, they're bouncing waves and trying to find things in the ground. And so there's this image that I found, if you've got a location of a pipe and you're trying to use your ground penetrating radar to find it, as you walk, you get these different reflections and your resulting image from the ground penetrating radar will actually form a hyperbola. And it, usually these things form only one branch. They don't form the two sides, it's just one side. 
And it looks like it's a parabola, but it's not really one. Um, I've also got images here from LORAN. So that just stands for long range uh, navigation systems. And so these are using hyperbolas as well. And these are formed by basically you've got these radar systems, these locations, these stations that are sending out signals. And then you're using like the, the, how the signals are interfacing with each other, with the locations, how long it takes for the signal to reach your object. And then you use that to kind of determine where your object is located. And it actually forms these parabolic, or not parabolic, hyperbolic lines. And so they have these charts that basically show the different branches of a hyperbola. And so there's an example here on the left, you've got these radar stations and you get these branches of a hyperbola around the, the stations and you got these multiple branches and the closer that gets to the middle, they kind of straighten out, but then they kind of, you know, angle more the, um, the farther away from the middle between the two stations. And you've got different depending on where the radar is. So like you can have one station that has um, a hyperbola going this way, but then your other station has like the hyperbola going this way. So you've got these multiple hyperbolas coming from the different stations and you're kind of looking for where they intersect to kind of figure out where the location of the object is that you're trying to locate or that you, you, you think is out there. Um, and so there's another image here that I found where it shows A and B are just two stations. It kind of showing how you've got these different hyperbolas that kind of give you a range of values, these different equations that you can use. Um, comets. So this is a you mentioned in the book, comets can most of the time comets are ellipses, but you can have comets that are hyperbolas, and those generally, they don't return. Like a comet that has an elliptical orbit will come back, but a comet that is on a hyperbolic orbit won't come back. We'll see it only once. And the shape of something like this is actually used a lot when we're trying to get things out into space, and we need to like use gra gravity to kind of shoot it around something, we actually will use hyperbolic orbits to get something out in, into space so that it can go and travel. And we're not, we, we don't do it elliptical because we don't want it to come back. We want it to leave gravity. So we use hyper, hyperbolas for that. Um, telescopes, they use um, mirrors that use hyperbolas to focus in certain ways. Uh, nuclear engineering, specifically the cooling towers, they are in the shape of hyperbolas, and that is the, specifically, they found that that is the, the most efficient um, shape to cool your radioactive material, so um, is in a hyperbola. So there's lots of applications for hyperbolas. But I just wanted to talk specifically about sound detection because there is an example on the homework about that. So I've just got, kind of got this image here. So how this works with sound detection is that you'll have multiple listening stations that are listening for sound waves. And so we've got station A, B, and C in their various locations here. And um, when you're doing a problem like this, you kind of want to make your origin the center. It just makes your math easier. So A and B are 6,600 feet apart. And then we've got a third station C, which is 1,100 feet north of station B. So I've kind of placed this on the a grid here using these coordinates and just saying that the center is at zero. So when you're detecting sound, be a, uh, an explosion or, um, you know, they, they do things like if there's gunshot detection systems that do something like this to determine where, you know, to try to figure out where the gunshot came from. 
So they'll detect something and then they figure out, well, how long did it take to detect it? And what is the difference between that and another station? So that you can kind of figure out, okay, if it takes this long to get to here, this long, you know, you're kind of figuring out based off of the differences. And that's where we get the hyperbola because the, it's the difference of the distances for a hyperbola. So we've got station B that is detecting an explosion four seconds before station A. So that tells us that the explosion needs to be closer to, such, to um, station B than station A because B heard it before A. Then we've also got that station C detects the explosion a second after station B, so it's closer to B than C. So that tells us that this location of the explosion is somewhere below B or south of B, if we're looking at this north, south, east, west. So it's in this quadrant four. And so I've just got this location purple as a, a potential location of where this explosion occurred. So when you're solving a problem like this, you don't know, I mean, all you know is the, the time it took and you have to know the speed of sound to figure out like the distance to kind of figure out how far how the sound traveled in those four seconds. But the key here is, let's say this is, this purple is our location of the explosion. The key is that we've got these two distances between A and B. And the distances need, to, the difference of the distances needs to be constant no matter where it is. And we've got this um, hyperbolic shape. It's a hyperbola. It has to be a hyperbola because of the fact that the difference of the distances has to be constant. And that difference of the distances comes from the fact that we're looking at the difference in the time that it takes to go from one to the other. So that difference is what we're looking at here. That's why it's not an ellipse. An ellipse is looking for the sum of the distances. But when you're looking at detecting sound, you're interested in the difference. So that's where we get the hyperbola. It has to be a hyperbola to fit that, that restriction. And so you don't know where exactly it is. All you know is you've got this hyperbola and everything that we're comparing to is station B. So that's why we kind of center at the location that we did. So we generally, you're, you've got one of your, the, the station that you're comparing to is one foci of the hyperbola. So we were comparing between station A and station B and station C and station B. So that means station B, which is the common point of comparison has to be the foci here. So that's why I've drawn it this way on the graph is I've got it as one of the foci of our hyperbola. And we know it's a hyperbola because we're looking at the differences here. And so we determine, now the explosion is we've got these two shapes if it was, you know, if A heard it before B and C, then the, it would be on the left branch here. But because B heard the explosion before A and C, it has to be on the right branch. So we know this possible location has to be the right branch. And we know it's somewhere below here in the bottom. And so um, we're not actually going to solve this because I just wanted to kind of talk about like hyperbolas and why they're used and how you know it's used and that sort of thing. But the key here is that this is a hyperbola because we're looking at the differences and the differences have to be the same because they're not changing. It's, you know, we're not suddenly hearing it four seconds and now hearing it three seconds between the same stations. That's the same. The difference is constant. So you kind of draw your picture here, kind of figure out, okay, the explosion is somewhere in this general location. And then once you have enough information, you can then use the equation of a hyperbola and the information you have to actually figure out the location, the specific location of that explosion. Now, on the Homer problem that's like this, 
we have only two stations, basically two points where we're hearing the sound. And so in order to pinpoint exactly, you need to have three points. So if you have two points, you don't know exactly where it's located. All you know is that it's on this particular shape, that it's on the hyperbola. So you can give an equation, um, but you don't know where exactly the coordinate is on that graph. You need a third point where you can locate a specific location, a specific ordered pair. So for the homework, um, number five on the homework is a hyperbola because it's dealing with sound, sound detection, and one person hears it before the other. You can't get a specific ordered pair. All you can get is the equation of the hyperbola. And you know that it's somewhere going to be on one of these branches. And you can determine which branch it's on based off of the information. But you can't get a specific ordered pair without having like a third person involved in order to help you to triangulate exactly where the sound occurred. So that's that's basically my introduction to hyperbolas. I wanted to focus on how it compares to the ellipse and so you can see the similarities and you can see that they're really not that different. It's just, you know, there's just small differences here. And then to also talk about how this is used with sound waves, radar, those sort of things, how the concept works and why it's a hyperbola versus it's not, you know, like circles or the ellipse, you know, because you might think, well, if I just look at where all these three circles intersect, well, that might be good enough, but that's not actually how it works. So it's actually a hyperbola. Um, and you can do your own research on, you know, they go into these systems. You can find tons of things. I found um, a lot of stuff from World War II talking about how this was used in World War II. They were using these hyperbolic paths, the Loran, to kind of determine where things were located in the ocean. Um, so there's a lot of stuff behind this. So are there any questions on kind of the concepts that I've covered here. Okie dokie. Well, that was, that was sort of it. <laughs> that, that was all I wanted to do.